created and committed to paper the proposition that we held certain truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain unamiable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And here's the important part, Bill, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted amongst men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. I thought it was like a blowtorch in history. It flared up the whole world. It lit the whole world up. It had never been said before. But it's a natural right of people to rule themselves. You mean God don't appoint a ruler to them? Look, well, that's what the kings have been telling us. And the gentry tells us <laughs> that we're supposed to keep our place. <laughs> All of a sudden, you say Boots Cooper, and you can get up, stand right upside governor of Texas. Lord have mercy. John Henry Falk died on the 9th of April, 1990. Bill Moyers and I lost a good friend. Texas lost an original, a native son, and America lost a patriot. I'm Stud Sterkel. government that we've established is it the great four great rights of the people conscience speech press and right to assemble are included in it because this great notion will guarantee in perpetuity the right and protect the right of people to voice those opinions we loathe and despise protect them with the same force it does those that we cherish and live by. Does this mean I'm a communist, Senator? That's awfully funny, isn't it, Mr. Secretary? That's terribly funny. This was the 1950s, the time of the Cold War, loyalty oath, Joe McCarthy. Blacklisting ruled the airways. If you wanted to discredit an otherwise legitimate political opponent... And didn't want to argue over what the real issues were. you call him a communist. Yes. They found a perfect way to shut off the political dialogue in our society. See? Now let's and go. shut up dissent. Of course I believe in the right to dissent, Congressman. The right to dissent's a sacred American right. I'll knock a man's teeth down his throat in the fear of my right to dissent. <laughs> when this was over, Louis Neiser wrote in his own book, A View, one lone man with virtually no resources dragged the defendants into court and although outrageously outnumbered, withstood starvation and disgrace and summoned enough strength to battle them into submission. Thank you for coming. I'm just glad to see you. John Henry Falk, a key figure in a landmark legal decision, an articulate spokesman for constitutional rights, and a very funny guy. Calvin Banks, uh, he uh, invented a do-it-yourself baptismal kit. It was for shut-ins. <laughs> and if you sent your money ahead of time, prepaid, Cal would send you an autographed picture of Jesus Christ that glowed in the dark. <laughs> and his eyes would follow you anywhere you went in the room. <laughs> Yeah.
John Henry Falk was one lone man in his fight against blacklisting and one lone man on stage. But he was never a lonely man. A guy once said, Johnny collects more friends in one afternoon than a watermelon has seeds. I'm Studs Turkle and I'm one of those friends for more than 40 years. On this rainy day, I am here on the south side of Austin, Texas, where John Henry Falk grew up. This was the family home. It's now a restaurant, elegant and famous, established by John Henry's sister, Mary Falk Cook. There are peacocks strutting in the yard where chickens used to be. But in a sense, this rambling old house hasn't changed that much. It was always warm and welcoming, full of kids and relatives and visitors, the sort of people who, years later, would become the inspiration for Johnny's characters. You know, he married somebody he's going to talk about. He's going to talk about the Magnus family. And he married Eloise Magnus. And he took his honeymoon down in Mexico. By himself. <laughs> I don't mind telling you, it hurt her feelings. John Henry is a humorist, an observer of the human comedy, but he has a point of view, and you spot that throughout his work. And we're often laughing, not so much at that person, but on recognizing that frailty in ourselves as well. And although Johnny's characters all seem to have their roots in the South, Johnny himself traveled the world. In the 1940s, John Henry packed up and moved to New York. In the next few years, he and his wife would have three children, and John Henry would build a career. I beg pardon. He didn't complain. Instead of food, he got moldy bread. Instead of meat, he cut the gristle and skin. Winter time, he chopped the wood barefoot in the yard, his hands and feet frozen. The black and blue marks showed through the holes in his pants. Did he complain? I don't understand. Why, why do you complain? Rosie? He never even complained to his father. <laughs> What's this? What's this? It's father, that drunk. You'll be heard from all in due time. Proceed. He had nobody to play with, ever. He never spent a day in a cheder, never had a book, never had a coat that wasn't somebody else's first. His father, drunk one night, threw him out of the house into the street. He picked himself up and went whichever way the wind was blowing. However hungry he got, he kept silent. He begged only with his eyes. How many times he was arrested? Vagrancy? Loitering? No visible means of support? I couldn't begin to tell you. How many times he got work? The dirtiest, the heaviest, the most menial, and didn't get paid. I couldn't list them all. And worse than working, harder was finding work. And through it all, silent. Could I suggest, please, time? Uh, is please. Like please. Like please. Please. No, you go ahead. When they splashed mud on him, when they spit on him, when they made him walk in the gutter and told him, keep off the sidewalk, when he stood in the doorway, begging for the money he was owed on a job, and they told him, come back later. Now it's not convenient. When they paid him, as they did, only part, or cheated him, he kept silent. Once, good fortune smiled. He stopped two runaway horses and saved the life of the man inside, the owner of the carriage, although the driver of the carriage was killed. He was made the coachman and inherited also a wife, and more than that, a child. The wife and the child of the driver killed in the accident. When his newfound protector went bankrupt and didn't pay him what he owed, he was silent. 
when his new wife ran away and left him with a newborn baby. He was silent. And later, when this same benefactor ran him down in the street and the carriage wheels rolled over him, he didn't even report to the police who had done it. And in the hospital, his back broken, nothing. And in a hospital, you could say anything, scream even it is permitted. Silence in his last minute on earth, in the death struggle, in death, silence. You're finished. One moment more. He was buried in a pauper's grave. Even the grave digger doesn't remember him. And a little stick was put up to mark the grave. The wind blew it over the next day, and the grave digger's wife found it and used it to stir a pot of potatoes. And in all, from birth to death, not a word against God. and not a word against man. The defending angel is concluded. Then the prosecuting angel. Angels in heaven. Angels in heaven. As he was silent, angels in heaven, so I will be silent. <gasps> Bonjour. Schweig. Bonjour, my child. Bonjour. suffered and you kept silent all your life. You never understood. You could have cried out and your voice would have shaken the walls of Jericho. The very walls of heaven itself would have fallen before your cry. You never knew your power, the strength of someone who never felt a moment's hate in his life. We will not judge you, nor will we pass sentence, nor try to find a reward that is just and proper and right for you. Take what you want. Everything is yours. Anything. Ask anything you like. It's yours. We mean it. <coughs> Everything is yours. 
Everything there is in heaven belongs to you because everything here is only the reflection of your goodness. You see, my bunche, you're only taking...